1973, Alan Wicker went way out west to blow the horn on Californian society, from the cult of the car to the wedding of the year. Doesn't she look beautiful? From those that are truly hell's angels pushed by their parents to those looking for heaven. If the end of the world comes, as you say, it's going to come very shortly. Are you going to welcome it? With joy. From Jesus communes to cosmetic surgery. I'd like to say I'm in the happiness market. Vintage Wicker Way Out West, Sunday at 8 on 4. The Alec Guinness season continues tomorrow night with the Lady Killers. This is Wilberforce. I understand you have rooms to let. You know, Professor, you didn't tell me the truth about yourself and these other gentlemen. You're not the least bit like amateurs. It ought to look like an accident. On Ring My Bell at midnight 15, why does Roger Scrutton think fox hunting is all that's worth living for? And could you handle some love advice from a grocer's daughter? Or would you prefer a date with a dream boy? Laurie Pike presents a different sort of chat show an hour from now, and they'll be waiting for your questions on 071 261 3535. Before that, though, Friday night continues with the word. Spread the word. The word. On the word tonight, Ted Danson on boldness, Burt Reynolds on fire, Laura Dern on sex. John Waters on crime, plus Sean Paul Gautier and the Mary Whitehouse experience in the studio, with live music from Nirvana and Interstellar. The word. <laughs> yeah, bold gang. We're coming to you live from the Bavarian Folk Night at the Hofbrau Beer Keller in Munich. Since John Major's been having such a tough time with the Eurocrats this week, I've come to Munich to do my bit for European harmony, and I can't wait to take my first bite of German sausage, I can tell you. But before that, I'll be hobnobbing with uh, some of the most beautiful people I've ever seen in my entire life, but not here because Italy's most famous politician and adult movie star, La Cicciolina, and Jeff Koons, her husband, the controversial American artist, have invited me back to check out some etchings at their pad. That's an old chestnut. If I've ever heard one, we'll have to see what transpires. I have to try and think what you do in my boots, Amanda. So over to you. I'll see you later. Bye. Anyway, thank you very much for bringing some culture to the show for once. Anyway, if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, then Terry and I should be very, very pleased with this little thing. There is, however, the word. All right, hi, I'm Terry Christian. All right, great. Stop and nonsense, stop and nonsense, bollocks, stop and nonsense. Stop and nonsense. Stop and nonsense. Funny, what, oh, that's great. That, all right, right, okay. Stop the nonsense. But first of all, Amanda. Hey. Now, 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 now. <laughs> Sam did nothing like me, did it, really? <laughs> You nick, you nick one of our jokes there. Here they are, Rob Newman and Dave Badil of uh, the Mary Whitehouse Experience. Welcome to the show. You don't have to bother giving them any applause. <laughs> You don't have to bother. <laughs> you don't have to bother. That, that was crew. Was that a planned thing? Did you spend ages They thinking? made me do it. They made me do it. Locked <laughs> me in a car, but I had to do it. Yeah. I don't know what made us think of it, actually, because I think a lot of what you say is very valuable, you know, <laughs> good analysis of contemporary society. I think we must have had some sort of blackout here, really. <laughs> also, the, the idea of Amanda being, you know, like a blow-up doll, I don't know where we got that from either. It's a very odd idea. Oh, I think you probably watched our show about four weeks earlier. <laughs> 
if, if these two guys had a disease, it'd be bubonic plagiarism. That's what I thought when I Ooh. saw it. Yeah, I but... look to you for a lot of our gags. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <coughs> I think that bubonic plague, plagiarism pun is going to come out <laughs> in the first show. Because it was very good. Got big laughs on those, too. Hey, listen, we're, we're in with the pond life tonight, I'm telling you. Now, uh, the Mary Whitehouse experience, you did, you did get a bit of trouble off uh, Mary Whitehouse herself, didn't you, about using the name originally. What happened there? Uh, what happened there? I think, she, I think she tried to get her name taken off the show, which is strange, because it doesn't actually refer to her. It refers to my aunt's friend <laughs> called Mary Whitehouse, um, who is just a lady who happens to be into bestiality and pornography. Um, <laughs> A lot of bestiality fans in tonight. I'm really <laughs> relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, she didn't like it. I don't know why not. She's a lovely woman. Anyone who says he's a stupid, interfering old git will have to deal with me. <laughs> you, know. you, you have actually been in trouble, haven't you, with the Broadcasting Commission about? Uh... Yeah. As, as was the first show that the broadcasting complaints thing took to court or whatever it, it happens. Yeah, and what it was set up about? like January the first, and then by January the third, when our first show went out. We were completely. I think some of them are here tonight. Um, <laughs> is yeah, it was because we called Henry Kelly a wanker on the show. <laughs> well, you've, you've, you've just done it again now, haven't you? I've just yeah. done it again, but we got away with it because it's fair comment, apparently. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Exhibit A, Henry Kelly. Okay, yeah. case dismissed. So that was it, apparently. Well, charming. What was it? What does he say in Manchester? Stuff and nonsense. Oh, I, I, I understand. <laughs> I haven't been ever. I well, I've never, I've never heard him say it. Stuff and nonsense. To be honest. Oh dear, I've got Rickett. Nish and Clish. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was in the 1960s. Mission. Anyway, here she is, Amanda. Yeah. Well, for you slightly more twisted viewers, here's what Katie found for you in New York last week. In America, they just can't get enough of it. It's on the streets, it's on TV, and now it's even on the newsstands. Crime, that is, because it's a brand new magazine devoted to the lifestyles of the mad and dangerous. Crime Beat magazine hopes to feed America's hunger for crime news. It gives the lurid lowdown on the women who can't resist a murderer, America's bloodiest home video, and the kids who go to school with guns. With a violent assault every six minutes in the States, there's no shortage of stories or readers. Crime Beat's only on its third issue, but it's already a sellout. I think people like to read about it because they feel lucky it didn't happen to them. They might have had a bad day, but at least they weren't slaughtered at McDonald's when they ate there at noon. With crime galore, the magazine hits at the heart of a national obsession. America is like a giant war zone. And, and everybody here gets to be a part of it. I mean, you couldn't go over and be in Desert Storm, you couldn't go over and be in Vietnam, but here you are, you're in the middle of this giant war going on around you. There's people dropping like flies. As the murder rate soars, crime's prime time on TV. America's Most Wanted is the top crime show, watched each week by 25 million wannabe crime fighters. Every network now has its own cop show, and it was only a matter of time before print followed the trend. There was no magazine quite like it. There's nothing on the stands right now devoted entirely to contemporary crime. Ted Klein is an ex-Twilight Zone editor, and seeing how crime can pay, he launched Crime Beat to give crime addicts a new fix. Crime junkie is the kind of person who reads the lurid crime story in the newspapers and is left wanting more. One such crime junkie is the movie director John Waters. He calls films like Female Trouble his crimes made to appall and shock. Waters has a weakness for crime books, adores homicide hearings, and collects bizarre souvenirs like this soil from a serial killer's basement, electric chairs big and small, and plastic roast beef. I like the magazine. I have a subscription myself. Mm -hmm. But I may get it for not the reasons that they put it out. I want to see how low they can go and how tasteless they can be. This story on page 13 about the last meals requested by death row prisoners stuck in a lot of people's throats. Thanks a lot. I'm about to chow down on James D. Autry's final craving before his execution in 1984. It may taste good, but is it good taste? Do you think that that was in bad taste? 
No, how can I say that? I mean, I wrote an article about what killers wore for a magazine here, and I, I know that some women have refused, right before they got the electric chair, refused their last meal because they said they were on diets. So, um, no, to me it's not in bad taste. To me that's interesting the same way any magazine covers little trivia. Mm -hmm. And Crime Beat just loves those criminal superstars, serial killers. It simply couldn't resist a lurid reference to the rotting genital organ found in the Milwaukee maniac's kettle. Do you think that you're glamorizing crime at all by this lurid reportage? I don't think there's anything lurid about our magazine, and I, I certainly don't think we're glamorizing crime. We are solidly pro-law and order and, and anti-criminal, and we're very pro-victim. Tired of being a sitting duck for criminals on America's mean streets? Well, you could enroll for target practice in a rifle range like this one. Or you could turn to page 28 of Crime Beat to find out how not to be a statistic. And that's the justification for Crime Beat. They call the magazine a survival guide for the 90s and give hot tips on personal security and no-go areas. They wish you didn't need it, but luckily for their sales, you do. And all crime magazines are caught in that ridiculous way of they have to pretend to be trying to do something good for people. When basically they're celebrating the worst in all humans is why I read it. But are all readers of Crime Beat so sick? Let's hope not. Nine out of ten subscribers are cops. I think it's uh, rather refreshing. It's poignant, uh, very well written. It's good to see articles written by members of the actual law enforcement profession and the uh, crime victims themselves. This month, Crime Beat hits the UK. But with British tabloids giving daily reports on homegrown criminals, we may already have our crime fill. In England, you have incredible good criminals there. I mean, you know, you don't... America has nothing on you. You've got the Morris murders, Mary Bell, some really famous ones that we can't even compete with. And Myra Hindley, who has the most famous hairdo from hell in the history of criminals. I mean, not doing those roots. That's why she's not out. Oh, that was... That was a, that was a low one, wasn't it, that? Mm. Carrot, character and taste. Fine dividing line with the Americans. That's a uh, crime beat. That's the uh, magazine. Lovely. Now, uh, John Waters there said, uh, if, if you're a killer and you're good-looking and you don't kill yourself, you know, that's, that's a ticket to media stardom. You think it's the same for, uh, you know, comedians like your good selves? <laughs> I've, I've totally lost in the syntax there. If you kill someone well, and I you don't get you, killed And yourself, you're good-looking and you don't kill yourself afterwards, you have no remorse. Tom O'Connor's thought about suicide after <laughs> a few of his jokes, but I can't think of anyone else who has. Yeah. I don't know, what do you think about that? I was hoping we'd move on to something else. Yeah, so to that sentence. <laughs> well, what, would you I was actually, interested in the, the bloke you, who had dismembered genitals in his kettle. Yeah. Because that made a funny cup of tea, I think. <laughs> we <went along. laughs> I didn't order rose here. What is this? Come on. I, I believe, uh, David, that you, you actually had a neighbour who was a serial killer, didn't you? Yeah, Dennis Nielsen was actually my neighbour. <laughs> uh, he, he wasn't right next door to me. He wasn't, like, neighbour's good friends, but he was... Uh, in the next street along, Dennis Nielsen. Do you feel kind of hurt that all the young men he chose? <laughs> yeah, he, he passed you up. <laughs> yeah, he was. There was this bloke who used to walk around the park and you know talk about dunking me in an acid bath and stuff like that, and that might have been him. But do you think? Did, did you ever see him? Do you think? No, I, no, I don't know really. <laughs> I remember when he was found, the police completely cut off you know the avenue and stuff. Mm -hmm. But no, I never saw him. Yeah, now he's very good at asking the questions, isn't he? Yeah, he, he sorry, was, sorry, yeah. sorry, but the accents are all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but uh, we'll uh, give you your book a plug in a few minutes' yeah. time. Yeah, uh, not now. Oh right, right. sorry. Not now. Listen, there's a few people have died on this show, but here's a genuine murder. Murderer, I should say, genuine over there with a man. Snuff TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I'm with comedian Al Murray. Now this is his first TV appearance, and in just a minute you'll understand why. Ow. Hello. I'm a murderer. I'd like to do some murders for you now, which maybe you can try at home after the show. The first of these is the Wolfer PPK 9mm automatic pistol with silencer. Thank you. 
Now, another favourite small arm of mine. This is the Soviet AK-47, 7.62mm gas-operated automatic assault rifle, known as the Kalashnikov, or Widowmaker. Big favourite with the Iraqi army. Looks good with a white flag tied to it. Thank you. Now another favourite Soviet weapon of mine. This is the Soviet RPG-7, handheld anti-tank and anti-personnel rocket launcher. 88mm bore, 1500 metre range. Very good for clearing out bunkers or heckling at military tattoos. Tonight's very special. Tonight I'll be using a Hesh round. That's high explosive squash head for all of you familiar with anti-tank weaponry here. Yeah, there are some of you in. <laughs> this one's a little large. I have to keep it in the boot of my car. <laughs> That was a direct hit. I am Al Murray. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> now, that, that wasn't really a uh, sick, sick humour, was it, there, from Al Murray? Was... No, it wasn't sick humour, but I was a bit worried by how many of the people in the audience were sort of laughing as if, like, yeah, yeah, that is the noise that a Kalashnikov makes. Yeah. <laughs> that worries me a bit. What, what, what is the sickest joke you've ever made? Sickest joke I've ever made. Uh, I don't know. I was thinking that um, you know, I would never make a joke about Robert Maxwell being so fat that when he fell overboard, that caused the flooding in the Philippines. You know, I, I'd never make a joke like that. Well, I'm, so I'm glad about that. I'm right. We're going to get loads of letters and phone calls now. Funnily enough, we did uh, have quite a few letters and phone calls last week because we did promise you an interview with Hollywood actress Laura Dern, daughter of uh, Bruce Dern and Diane Ladd. And uh, one guy, Steve in Liverpool, actually sent in a poem, said, the programme promised that we'd learn a bit about Laura Dern, and although we were very keen, Laura Dern was never seen. Well, listen to this now. Our editor's not a charming chap. Deserving, he's deserving of a healthy slap. On Amanda and myself, he's always picking an ideal candidate for a good group kicking. <laughs> but your poem caused him such great concern that here, just for you, is Laura Dern. <laughs> Laura Dern has been described as a disarming mix of feminist and femme fatale. One of the lynch mob, she's best known as the sexy southern belle Lula in Wild at Heart. You really do. You mark me the deepest. A cross between a sex pot and a crack pot. Wild at Heart was sort of just, you know, going off and like, you know, letting Lucille Ball and Marilyn Monroe take over or whatever. Just want two more moments and my toes will be dry. It forced me also just on the set to go wild and not worry about what anybody thought. Laura's 24 and has been acting since the tender age of seven. By the age of 11, she had an agent and her first leading role in Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains. She has, of course, one of the greatest Hollywood assets, famous parents. What? Laura's father is actor Bruce Stern, and her mother, Diane Ladd, starred with her in Wild at Heart as her glamorous mother. I remember on the first day of Wild at Heart, one of the crew members said to David Lynch, 
God, you know, it's really amazing. The casting is unbelievable because she really looks like her mother. And I said, you idiot. They are mother and daughter. You know who that was. And you know that you aren't. And I mean are not going to see him ever. End of story. Like hell. Well, Laura's just as headstrong about her scripts and is rumored to have turned down a role in Oliver Stone's movie, The Doors. I'm consciously rejecting things that I can't fall in love with, things that I don't think have integrity. You know, some people think when I say that, that it means that I've always got to do Sophie's Choice or it's not going to be real work. I think Arthur is one of the more moving movies I've ever seen in my life. I can laugh for two hours and find it a totally brilliant movie, so I don't think, you know, everyone has to be sobbing throughout the film for it to mean something. But to make her characters meaningful involves some rather serious method acting, like learning... How to blow bubbles and bubble gum, how to smoke a good cigarette, which I choose not to do, because I thought I would die after a while at heart from nicotine poisoning. Since the release of her latest film, Rambling Rose, Laura has hit the front covers and she's also won Best Actress Award at the Toronto Film Festival. Laura plays Rose, a free-spirited young woman who tries to provide more services than the Southern family who employ her originally bargained for. She has absolutely no control over her sexual impulses. Girl strikes like a cold. Sex to her is just flesh and the physical body, but what she wants is to be touched uh, internally through her heart and her soul and, and to find that kind of love and protection um, that comes when you meet Mr. Wright. You never guess what happened. I had met Mr. Wright. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are a lot of theories that men are always sort of um, how do I say this without being lascivious? Walking through life with, you know, something else thinking for them. Is that well done? Um, and that, that women are less oriented in that uh, area, that region. I'm going to tell you a secret. Girls don't want sex. Girls want love. And Laura's search for love involved a four-year romance with Blue Velvet co-star Carol McLachlan. Girls have been raised in this world of Walt Disney movies that says, you know, one day you will awake from a sleep because a prince will kiss you and take you off on a white horse to his beautiful castle and you'll live happily ever after. I'm still waiting. The word. Laura Dern. Coming up after the break, we've got music from Interstellar and fashion guru Jean, Bo Jean Paul Gaultier joining us on the couch. Which one of these stars owns a painting by a mass murderer? Kevin Costner, Rob Lowe, Johnny Depp, Sean Penn. Find out after the break. The word. That's it. Well, I was born and raised. Well, you didn't go angry then, did you? Now I'm going to show you what I did my courting. Who says romance is dead? This is where I had my first taste of the finer side of life. McEwen's exports. Has this place changed much? Aye. These days, they're letting anybody in. McEwen's export. It's class in a glass. In this week's You magazine with the Mail on Sunday, there's a free antique and collectibles guide. Most interesting. 16th century. 15,000 pounds. <gasps> it could reveal hidden treasures around your home, whether they're worth a few hundred pounds or even more. Well, it should fetch at least uh, 25. What? Wow. No. The Antiques Price Guide, free with You Magazine, this Sunday.
past Woolworths to make your Christmas? When Jack Lucas dropped out of his world, let the bombs go! He landed in the realm of the Fisher King. I'm a knight on a special quest. Where romance lives. I'm deeply smitten. Where friendship counts. If I could help him get him this girl that he loves. Mrs. Perry. <laughs> maybe things would change for me. And life can begin again. Robin Williams, Jeff Bridges, The Fisher King. you which one of these celebrities owns a painting by a mass murderer the answer is Johnny Depp painter John Wayne Gacy killed 33 people
pandemonium in this place, I tell you, pandemonium. The cheapest night out in London on a Friday. Uh, that's Interstellar, taken from the album Stella and the Interstellar Family of People. And very nice too. And uh, I like to frock, but somebody who's uh, made his living, I suppose, and made his name, and a very famous name it is too, through designing very nice frocks and other clothes, is uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier, fashion guru. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people know you, you know, especially since, uh, you, you know, your involvement with Madonna, that's really kind of, you know, put you on the front pages. How did you actually meet Madonna in the first place? In the first place, uh, no, I saw her the first time she was in MTV Award, you know. It was uh, the first time she uh, sang like a virgin, and she was great, you know. But the audience was absolutely like very Puritan American type, you know. So they were very quiet. But me, I was like making an ovation alone, not alone. We were like more than maybe ten, you know. And well, she was great. You, you designed all the clothes for her Blonde Ambition tour. We're going to have a look now yeah. at some of the clothes. The cones on the chest. It's like ice cream, no? <laughs> ice cream cones. <laughs> yeah. She, she likes to be Yankee Panky, no? Yeah, well, well I've, <laughs> how, how did you uh, come to be giving her a spanking? Because she was naughty, you know? She can Whoa. be very naughty. <laughs> is, is that the kind of thing that uh, French guys get up to? Maybe, yes. It's very French attitude, I think. <laughs> what, what about Madonna's vital statistics? Is she a size 14, really? Oh, she's <laughs> even more than that on top part, you know? Maybe here, she's a little more. She has a very, very thin uh, waist. And the nice hips. She's a beautiful woman. Mm. She comes over as a quite hard-faced, you know, quite a hard woman. If you if you see uh, the oh, in bed with Madonna uh, film, <laughs> is she actually like that? I didn't try that for the moment. I asked her if I could marry her. You know, she didn't <laughs> give the uh, answer. I asked her three times. First time she said maybe yes, but we have to make a very serious contract. You know. Second time she said me no, maybe uh, it's maybe better not. You know, because after we will not be any more friend. So I am asking again. I, uh, I am waiting for the ultimate answer. You know. Now, now you, you yourself, obviously, uh, you know, you didn't come from a long line of fashion designers. How, how did you start in the business? How did I start? I started, you know, by sending, like, sketches, you know. I didn't go to school for design, you know. I sk sent sketches to different uh, de uh, designers, to Pierre Cardin, and at the age of 18, the day of my birthday, he said, you can come and you work with me. So I worked with him, I, I, and I started like that. Now, now, a lot of people say that us, especially the French, say that us British don't dress very well. I believe that I would have never believed Are you sure that people say that? No, at the contrary. <laughs> May I admire a lot what is happening in the street of London? I think that they are very personal and they have a sense of extravagance and uh, personality. So it's good. It, it must be, to be extravagant affording your clothes, I was going to ask you if you could. Uh, design an outfit for myself and Amanda. Okay. A separate so one each, paper, preferably. Because I have always a paper with me because I am working every day. So you should like a, uh, one for you. So oh, definitely. For you, I don't like very much the colour of your shirt for the moment. So I should suggest you to have something like a T-shirt, oh, very we're, simple. We'll come to you at the end for that. What? <laughs> We'll come, to, we'll come to you later on for that. You don't have to rush yeah. it. <laughs> so. hey, you get plenty of time on this show. <laughs> but now, from uh, one, of the, one of the world's most famous and biggest producers of fashion to London's biggest consumer, Amanda. I'll ignore that one, Terry. Anyway, later on, we'll be getting the bald truth out of Ted Danson. But first of all, this. The following information on star-sensitive stories is for operational use only. It's the record that hit the headlines in America this week. The unauthorized Jermaine Jackson track, which was leaked to a Los Angeles radio station. Jermaine is singing about Brother Michael, the serial nose job man who turned from black to white. Once you were made, you changed your shape. Was your color wrong? Could not turn back. It's a known fact. You were too far gone. Jermaine said, it's a healing song. Sounds rather like Latoya's book. Distant cousins. Barbara Windsor, Elizabeth Windsor. Mission data. Oh, yes, I'm leaving now. I've had enough. I'm tired of you. 
This is Kim Appleby's new record. It's really jolly good, but is that a spot? Just there. Hope it clears up in time for Top of the Pops, Kim. Ugh. Funny how those old snapshots come back to haunt you. This is Laura Dern with Charlie Sheen and his anorak back in 1985. Despite the anorak, Charlie Sheen went on to become a successful superstar and poet. The Carringtons are back in Dynasty, the miniseries. It didn't even make the top ten in America, so to save you the misery of watching it, here's the big fight. Crusher Crystal versus Alexis the Alley Cat. It's you. <laughs> That was a nasty blow. Whoops, there goes the wig. What's in the bargain bin this week? We've tracked down a classic cut from 1983. It's Cindy and the Saffrons, AKA wannabe pop star Joanne Wally Kilmer. Luckily, Joanne has a new career as a Hollywood film star. Her new film, Shattered, is out today. Now, it's, it is a rather cultured show tonight, what with uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier on. And, of course, one of the world's leading artists, you're going to see him on the show, and also one of uh, Europe's most controversial politicians. The artist is uh, Jeff Koons, an American artist, and the politician is La Cicciolina, uh, an Italian politician, who is actually married to the artist Jeff Koons. And uh, here's a picture of their, well, of their wedding, one of the wedding snaps. This is the wedding cake. You can guess which one's which, I won't bother. I won't bore you with the uh, gory details. And this is uh, one of Jeff Koon's pictures, which actually sold for $100,000. And uh, there is actually an exhibition of Jeff Koon's art, <laughs> of, of him and the missus, kind of readers' wives in oils. And uh, that's opening in Cologne next week. So, you know, organise a coach from your local pub, a few Nuki Browns in the back, and get over there. Meanwhile, over in Munich, with La Kitchelina and Jeff Koon's, is our Katie. Katie. <coughs> Terry, you might be wondering why I'm wearing my pajamas. Well, Jeff Koons and his lovely wife, La Cicciolina, also known as Ilona, wanted to talk to me in bed. And I'm just a girl who can't say no. So if you pull the camera back a little bit, you'll see that they're in their bedroom attire as well. Ilona. <laughs> what was this about you having a hot date with Saddam Hussein? Oh, Can you tell Saddam me? Hussein? Yes. You're curious. <laughs> uh, you remember when, uh, when his day war, war uh -huh. Iran, Iraq? I uh, speak, I come in uh, embassy uh, Iraqi you know, in Rome, and I speak uh, with um, ambassadore. If uh, Saddam Hussein give uh, in change, change uh, give um, hostage, I uh, in in change I uh, make sex with him. But this because I no want war, I uh, give sex for no war in change. You understand? And did, did he want sex with uh, you? No. <laughs> I don't understand. Can you understand that? I mean, were you jealous? I thought uh, it was a beautiful <laughs> gesture, but I thought the chances since uh, Hussein being Muslim that uh, I didn't have too much to worry about. Jeff, I don't think you have too much to worry about because I have seen the maid in heaven silk screens <laughs> and the real McCoy. <laughs> Are you satisfied? Hmm. I am very satisfied. Ask you, Jeff. Satisfied? Uh, we enjoy very much uh, making love and uh, it's a form of listening in life which is very important. To well, I don't know if I'd need to listen in because it's coming out <laughs> loud and clear from those photographs and sculptures and things like that. <laughs> Lily. Now, what was it that first attracted you to Ilona? Was it her role as a politician or that of a sex symbol? Lily, uh, when I first met Ilona, what really attracted to me was uh, she was wearing a bustier. A uh, guépier. Guépier. <laughs> Guys, but, uh, they never had... know the fashion details. But uh, <laughs> she had no pants on, so I was hooked. 
Well, I must say, <laughs> eye-catching. Um, now, what about your marriage? Do you think that's just more of an artistic statement than a genuine romance? Mm. Uh, we believe it's an eternal statement because uh, spiritually, we're very much in love, but um, we are working on uh, biological sculptures. Biological sculptures, is that what they're calling it now? <laughs> I just thought you were glad to see me, Jeff. My goodness. Oh, now, if we can all slip into our leader hose, and I think it's time for a bit of boogieing down at the beer keller again. So, we'll see you later, Terry. Kathy. <laughs> Come on, guys. Oh, oh see you. <laughs> I, I'm about to find out about Jeff's husband. With the dog, too. Every three. I, 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 heard, you, I heard you loved animals, but mm. talk about menage a cut with stuffed animals as well. This is sick. I'm loving it. No, I'm so glad I got this job. <laughs> Jeff. And more mainstream appeal on the word after the break when we get cheer star Ted dancing out of the closet and we've got music from Nirvana. See you then. Which one of these celebrities was once a chauffeur for Kissagram Girls? Mickey Rourke, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Tom Berenger. Find out after the break. The word. Shout. Rhythm Divine 2 is out. Now. I didn't have much parental guidance. Baby, you better run me back to the hotel. You got me hotter in Georgia asphalt. HMV, no video. This is Y'all ready for this? The best of dance 91. 32 of the hottest club hits from the whole year. my shirt. The best of dance 91. Let the music speak for itself. Over and out. We asked you which one of these celebrities was once a chauffeur for Kissagram Girls. The answer is Brad Pitt. I've said it before, what a cultured show tonight. Unfortunately, uh, Melvin Bragg couldn't make it, but we have got the Mary Whitehouse experience and Jean-Paul Gaultier. And if that isn't star-studded enough for you as a little cast on our couch, we have also got this exclusive interview with cheer star Ted Danson. Ted Danson has been in this bar for a decade, and it shows. You were being in my dreams! I'm pathetic. I am pathetic. I get up in the morning out of guilt. I go to the bathroom out of guilt. I have guilt, you know, drives me. It's a motivating force. I always feel like an imposter, to tell you the truth. Whenever I'm around other actors, I always feel apologetic. I'm just now beginning to enjoy it a little bit more. No wonder Cheers earns him $10,000 a day. $10,000? And he doesn't exactly work too hard. We don't learn what we need to learn until the last second. In rehearsals, they play table football. We play it fiendishly. How was your day at work, honey? It has nothing to do with, you know, did you act well? It has to do, did you win? You know, that is the whole point of Cheers now. Ten years ago, Edward Danson III was a little-known daytime soap actor and Aramis model. Cheers hit the top of the ratings and made his name as the lusty barman, Sam Malone. Second. Carl, never disturb me unless there's a customer. He was a notorious womanizer. You'd like to laugh? <laughs> I love to laugh. How did you know? Call it a hunch. The great ones make it look so easy. <laughs> Acting has to be flirtatious. My mother told me to watch out for guys in bars. Well, then let's get out of this bar so you don't have to worry. Sexual tension, sexual... Acting is very sexual. But right now... <laughs> Being turned on is a good way to act. Mm, what kind of movie shall we see? Something short. <laughs> One of the funny things about Sam as a womanizer uh, is he is so transparently sad, you know, and unsuccessful in his determined lifestyle. I know. Let's do something that you have never done before with a woman. All right, all right. But Ted and Sam are very different. 
I don't go to bars. Uh, I, I, I'd rather die than ask somebody to dance, you know, in, in fear that they'd reject me. One right. person who hasn't been rejecting Sam Malone is Rebecca, played by Kirstie Alley. Pick you up around 8 o'clock. Pick me up now. Mm. There's talk that this could be the final fling for Cheers. The series might go out on top. Sam, just give it a yank. Ow! <laughs> drive down New York streets and people lean out of cabs saying, you know, don't you stop doing that show. If he does, Ted won't be idle. He's gone green. The only way not to be dependent on foreign oil is to not be dependent on oil. He's got a bright future in rap movies. Huh! <coughs> Introduce it, Matt. Peter and Jack, were you rabbits? Were you dad's doing the Mary rap? And he can keep a straight face. The child doesn't look anything like me. I'm bigger, and, and I have more hair. So what's this, then? They have a poster of me in New York where they have sp sprayed, airbrushed me totally bald. You know, instead of just my pathetic little hole back here, I'm, like, totally bald. So I have a statement to make. And my statement is that I am not totally bald, but I am proud to announce that I'm gay. Thank you. The bird. Ted Danson coming out of the closet as a baldy bear. But I, I really ought to start with the younger guys first. I mean, that's something that could look at it, you know, the tie starts going out, it's the rigors of life. Yeah. Uh, Do you think blokes should wear wigs though when they start going bald? Yeah, I think people should wear wigs. I remember there was a comedian <laughs> called Nick Hancock on the camera circuit who used to say, if you are bald, you look stupid. And I think that is really true, really, one way or another. What, what, about, what about you, Robbie? Is your tide going out a bit? I've noticed um, just a lot of winos, right? About 60, they've got just perfect heads of hair, and like 68 year old winos, and that's like, so I think if I drink a lot of mess and. <laughs> I have to urinate in my hair. Well, hang it's, on. it's quite fashionable these days. I, you might be able to help me on this. It's quite fashionable to, for bands and stuff to look, have a hairstyle in the style of Bruce Forsyth's wig. I don't know if you know. <laughs> but like the lead singer of The Farm has got his, he his head in the style of Bruce Forsyth's wig. Do you, do, you, do you think blokes should wear wigs if they go bald? No, I think when you are bo uh, a little bald, at that point you, you shave everything. I think it's better, no? Or if you uh, put a wig, you have to put an extravagant wig, you know, very funny, you know, at that point. <laughs> and maybe there are some people that need also to have some wig on here, on here, on here, on uh, right. somewhere else, you know. There's a lot. So. Certainly not the Italians, though. They're airy enough as it is. The Italian, yeah. But mm. it's English also. And then bald, bald is quite sexy, I think. Of course, uh, Amanda, are you the sort of girl who finds bald men sexy? Well, no, but obviously Ted Danson fans are. Anyway, in a minute, I'll be talking to Bert Reynolds. But first of all, let's look at a clip which was taken when his, uh, his toupee caught fire whilst filming recently. Here it is. <laughs> hello, Bert. Oh, hello, Amanda. That fire looked really nasty. What happened? Uh, I went up in flames, and what saved my life was because I'd been set on fire so many times in my career as a stuntman, I knew to keep my eyes closed, not to breathe, and hit the floor as quick as I could and wrap myself in the rug, and nothing caught on fire, even my hair, which, by the way, is not real, but had, uh, had, had lots of, of um, stuff in it. Uh, um, huh? Gel. Gel. You see, I have, a, I have an expert that I ask everything. I'm asking my age. It had pyro jelly in it. I put it in my hair so that it wouldn't go up in flames. So even though the people thought, my God, the first thing that'll go up, because artificial hair goes like that. But this is, an art, this is artificial hair, but it's sewn to my head. Do you mind people knowing about your hair? I make jokes about it. I make jokes about it all the time. I make jokes about my short legs. I make jokes about... Uh, my cowboy boots, I make jokes about me. You see, my father told me when I was about 14 years old, make fun of yourself, son, because there's millions of people out there that can do it better than you. Are there any jokes that you object to? Well, there were lots of funny stories about when I was sick. I mean, they're, they're funny now, they weren't funny then, but I, I started hyperventilating and I, because I was panicking and I, and they rushed me to the hospital, and as I was being wheeled down the emergency room, uh, 
nurse, this very sweet little nurse, came up, and I, I, th I really thought it was the last thing I was ever going to say. And she said, are, are you dying, Mr. Reynolds? And I said, I don't know. I said, oh. She said, well, could I have your autograph? And I said, I thought, you know, if I'd have had the strength, I'd have decked her, but I couldn't move my arms. And then I thought, you know, this, this could be the final thing. I mean, when I get there, you know, St. Peter's should say, you know, when you signed that autograph, that's what got you in here, pal. So I signed it, because I thought it might be my ticket in. When you were sick, your career suffered as well. I mean, how did you deal with that? Well, I coped with it. Uh, I was really proud with the way I coped with it. I didn't come out with any baggage, and by that I'm not... Uh, I didn't carry any real anger with me. And I, I, I understood. I, I, I've been around a long time. I, I've been doing this a long, long time. I started... My first paycheck was in 1956, so uh, I've seen people reach across my face to get someone's autograph who, you know, five years later they were reaching across my, you know, his face to get mine. Uh, it, it, it is a, a peaks and val valleys and all that, and if you believe the, the good and all the wonderful accolades and ridiculous things that some people are saying about you, then you also have to, to believe the bad. And, uh, and that's pretty horrific sometimes. So the best thing to do is surround yourself with people who will always tell you the truth and, and uh, sort of hang with you and, and be your friends. And by that, I don't mean people that are hang with you and agree with everything you say. Did your friends stick by you? Some, not all, a great deal of them left. But uh, it saves me a lot of money in Christmas cards every year. Well, I hope you'll send me one. Thank you very much, Bert. You're very welcome, and you're quite sexy. Thank you, Bert Reynolds. Well, it's over to Katie now for a bit more fun. Hi, Amanda. We're back at the Bavarian night of the Hofbrau House. Who could keep away? The night's still young, and we're about to hit the floor with our own version of the Oompa Pa. But meanwhile, next week, we'll be meeting the women who love the men who do love their heavy metal. Woo! And this is going to be at the Skid Row concert in Edinburgh. But meanwhile, I'm off to do some heavy clogging. And La Chicholina said that she'd play the Gawkenspiel for me. So I'm going to go out and do my thing. See you later. Bye. Ooh. Katie there out of the Pavilion Beer Night. Let's hope she doesn't talk to any locals with relatives in Argentina or Brazil. Uh, now, Sean Paul, you've designed a couple yeah. of outfits for Amanda and my good self. You want me to explain a little how it yes. is like? Yes. yes. Yeah, so, quickly. Yes. that's first for you, Terry. It's a, like a kind of sharp skirt <laughs> of a trouser and with a black turtleneck. You should look very no, nice no, and sexy like no, that. No, no cut piece. And, and for you, Amanda. and for you, and with a cut piece, yes. So, <laughs> for you, it's like a corset for pregnant, pregnancy corset. Thank you very much. So sexy, you can, uh, you have to see your little uh, bum. Uh, stomach, bum. bum. <laughs> My little bum? Yeah. And, Thank and, you and, very much. It. I will do. And Next time you wear it, huh? Okay, I will you you make over. it for me. Yeah. <laughs> and you are over here with the shop opening as well, aren't you? Yes, it's on uh, next Monday, it's opening. Okay, here in London. South Ken. Yeah. Okay, South Ken. A quick, quick plug for your book. Yeah, buy Mary, this. Mary Whitehouse Experience is like BJ, it's uh, in the shops as from yesterday. Okay, thanks a lot for coming with us. Uh, next week we've got quite a bit of music on Black Sheep, Tesla, and Extreme. Meanwhile, here's Nirvana kicking it up good style. 600,000 copies of their album in the USA. And first time live on TV. See you next week. I'm like all of you people in this room know that Courtney Love, the lead singer of the sensational pop group Hole, is the best fuck in the world.